you know, I just couldn't get a word in edgewise. So I guess I'm making up for it now with two presentations in one afternoon. Um, I hope everybody still has some brain cells left after that amazing um, presentation by Dr. Barkley, who is a personal hero of mine. Um, I know that some people have said, oh, you know, well, all those things he talked about were so depressing. But, you know, sometimes you have to confront a problem head on in order to, to um, you know, to champion, to, to come out on top and to make the most of a situation. If you deny it or kind of put a sugar coating over it, you most likely won't ever come out real successful on the other side if you're having real ADHD challenges. And I believe in confronting things head on. And um, so when I realized that my husband at age 37 had ADHD, um, I was a little ticked off because we had been to couples therapists, he had been to doctors, and um, because he, you know, there's often associated health challenges. He was exhausted from the mental and physical effort he was putting forth every day, first to get his PhD in molecular biology. He's a McGill graduate in Montreal. He's a Quebecois, my husband's Canadian. Um, and, um, you know, none of the doctors or therapists figured it out. And, and I just thought, this is ridiculous. If a Ph.D. molecular biologist with a postdoc in neurology and an ex-girlfriend who's a neurosurgeon, for Pete's sakes, you know, and a, and a well-read journalist didn't figure this out, who's going to figure it out? You know, what about everybody else, people that don't have access to all these resources and aren't so highly educated? So I decided to take my, I've been a journalist for 30 years, and so most of us journalists are kind of crusader rabbits at heart. And I decided to take the skills that I had and try to create more awareness. And um, as um, Heidi kindly mentioned during Dr. Barclay's lecture, the book won four awards last night in New York at the big publishing conference. Thank you. And what I'm, what I'm so excited about, I told the last group, I don't need awards at this time in my life. It's like, you know, I just want some rest, <laughs> you know, awards. It's nice. But what I like is that that means that there's that much more ADHD awareness out there. Um, because it's kind of hard to, to penetrate the popular media sometimes. I thought it was going to be easy to promote the book because I have lots of friends at newspapers. But... Um, Unfortunately, they don't take it very seriously. And a lot of them have said, oh, yeah, we know about ADHD. It's a gift. And you just have to find the right partner to appreciate it and the right job to appreciate it. And I thought, well, it's not quite that simple. So anyway, so that's what I'm here to talk about today, uh, to see if ADHD is the elephant in the room of your relationship. And I use the terms ADD and ADHD interchangeably, mainly because I just lapsed to the old term. But I guess everybody knows that AD slash HD is the official term. And it's that, that slash means with or without hyperactivity. It's kind of like a side dish, you know, an option. So um, I think ADHD is the elephant in the room of a lot of things, you know, of society, of therapist offices, of employment offices. But it's especially... Um, the elephant in the room of relationships. And if you go to a couples therapist, they'll often focus on communication and all the things that couples therapists do. But if they miss ADHD, you're missing a critical piece. And uh, that's the reason I called the book, and, and is it you, me, or adult ADHD? Because it's not about which partner is to blame. It's about the idea that we're missing this third entity, and a very important entity in the relationship, and that's ADHD. I'd like to remind everybody I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist. I like to take some of them to task, which is kind of fun, being kind of a watchdog. But um, I also um, am offering the expertise of people much smarter and more experienced than me in this area, and these are some of their names. So what I'd like to talk about, and this is not a scientific concept, you're not going to see this in any DSM, it's ADHD's double, triple whammy. Do not try this at home. That's kind of what the double, triple whammy feels like it when you're stuck in it, like you stuck your tongue in the uh, mixing implement. So let's break it down. What's the first part of the double, triple whammy? It starts with the late-to-diagnosis adult with ADHD. So what we mean by late-to-diagnosis is the adult who doesn't know he or she has ADHD until maybe 30s, maybe 20s, 30s, 40s. I've known people in their 80s who've had their first diagnosis. And here's what's common, their triple whammy. It's a three-layer kind of effect. 
you start with the ADHD neurobiology, and then you add on top of that unrecognized ADHD symptoms. And those get misinterpreted and often elicit ne negative feedback from childhood on. And we'll look at some examples. So you get a lot of negative feedback, and what's going to come from that? Negative mindsets, often. And you'll develop negative mindsets about yourself and often about other people. Because people can often seem very unfair. Um, poor coping strategies then spring from the negative mindsets. And what are, what are some of these uh, neurobiological traits? Well, I ask the partners of adults with ADHD, because sometimes they're um, more objective observers. And besides, that was the population I had to work with through the online support group. So 166 partners of adults with ADHD took this survey. And I have, uh, there's a lot more questions in the survey, like 76, and I detail them at the website ADHDpartner.org. I'm writing a blog about the, about the information from the survey. And so I took the symptoms from the DSM, from the diagnostic um, criteria, and I said rate them as far as how prevalent they are in your partner. And what do we see at the top? Easily distracted, difficulty organizing tasks and activities, difficulty sustaining tasks or attention and tasks, forgetful in daily duties, loses things necessary for tasks and activities. Any of these sounding familiar yet? How many people here have ADHD? Okay, and how many have partners with ADHD? So, you're kind of outnumbered here. But just, some of you are arguing about whether it's the case or not. <laughs> we'll get him yet. <laughs> um, and then, um, but look at the bottom. Um, feels on the go or driven by the motor, driven by motor, talks excessively, leaves seat in situations where seating is expected. Um, you know, those just aren't as common, but unfortunately those are the things that a lot of people think is ADD. And that's what I thought with my husband. I thought, well, he can't have, I never thought of ADHD because ADHD was the little kid across the street who really had trouble keeping his mouth closed and he's always running around and sometimes run out in the street, you know, worry his mother to death. And I thought, well, that's ADHD. I just didn't know much about it. So, and I think that's true for a lot of us. We don't understand the subtleties that Dr. Barkley so elegantly outlined. So, but before you know about ADHD, I asked the respondents, how did you explain your partner's problematic behavior? Well, again, come the, you know, the misinterpretations and the negative feedback. Scatterbrain or absent-minded, immature, dysfunctional family background, selfish, passive, lazy or introverted. Uh, Passive-aggressive, that's a big one you'll get from the therapist when you go to therapy for couples counseling. Uh, has anybody gotten that? Has anybody been called passive-aggressive? Or maybe that's going out of style now. I don't know. Maybe they've moved past it. I've noticed in the last few years therapists are getting a lot better about recognizing ADHD. It depends if they attended your presentation or not. Well, they're learning from a lot of people before me. Um, and so then I also ask them, well, yes, we know they're about these problems, but how significant are they? Organization was the big thing. Now, how many people in the public do you think would have guessed that, that organization is the big problem? And that means organiz organizing yourself around the house, uh, whether you're a woman with ADHD or a man, um, how well organized is your home? How organized are you when you're ready to go to work in the morning? How organized are you at work? How organized are you over time in reaching your goals? Are you taking each step or are you just kind of responding to whatever stimuli crosses your path? Starting and finishing tasks. We've talked a bit about um, some guys with ADD in particular seem to like home fix-it projects. You know, you get see that slide hammer, you see that wall, and they got to meet, you know, because you want to make a bigger room. But does it always get finished? Well, not always. Um, one guy in the last group insisted that he liked groutless tile. And, and what did I have against it? <laughs> he was kidding. But, um, you know, it's kind of, that's often of you, like the last 5% that can be really hard for the person to push through. Uh, listening skills. You know, focusing on what the person's saying while they're saying it and not listening to all those 20 other channels in your head. Mood and temper. That's another one that most people don't get. And that's why I think a lot of people get misdiagnosed with bipolar because um, some of the irritability and anger issues. Sleep can be really tough for people with ADD. This is a big topic in my adult ADD group. We talk about sleep a lot. 
And actually, some people sleep much better on stimulants. So that's kind of a discovery. You won't often hear it from your doctor because they all think, oh, the stimulants keep you awake. And that's true for a lot of people. But some people will get really good sleep. And, um, but just the act of going to sleep is probably the most boring and tedious thing you can do. You're, you go to bed and you're lying there waiting for nothing to happen. You know, that does not go, well, go down well with the ADHD wiring. Cooperating. But again, look, relaxing and sitting quietly is at the bottom of the list. So what are ex examples of some of the negative mindsets? When I'm successful, it's due to luck. It's like, oh, it just happened. Because you don't always remember the steps that you took to arrive to that uh, place of progress. And you don't often have confidence that you can do it again. So you think it's just you lucked out. So there's a lot of imposter syndrome with adults with ADHD. I'm less worthy than others. I always make mistakes. There's kind of an always never thing with ADHD. Dr. Barkley talks about it being a, a condition of dysregulation, and that means that there's often underdoing and overdoing, and there's not a lot of gray area. So it's like I always make mistakes, or then there's the person with ADD who's in complete denial, and I never make mistakes. It's everybody else that has a problem. I have little control over my life. The world is unfair, because actually when you think about it, if you have undiagnosed ADD, the world does seem unfair. People are always angry with me. I am pessimistic that life can improve. And so if you have those kind of mindsets, what are your coping strategies going to be? And really, if you have those mindsets, you've got to credit anybody who can get out of bed every day and, and keep trying to fight the good fight. Because really, you know, a lot of us would just kind of uh, collapse and just say, never mind. Um, so what are some of the poor coping strategies? Denying and minimizing. Um, oh, the dent in the car is not that bad. Or, you know, I didn't go into that much bankruptcy, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, there's just all kinds of ways of um, denying and minimizing. Avoiding, is anybody familiar with the idea of having the discussion later? Or not at all? Or, well, that's the same thing, right? Never. Later. We'll talk about that later, honey, meaning never. Because, you know, really, when you think about it, these are perfectly rational because the person with ADD knows that if they try to have a discussion, it's not going to go well. <laughs> they're not gonna, maybe aren't going to be able to focus on what the partner wants them to understand or they're not going to be able to do things better the next time. So why even go there? It just doesn't make sense. Quitting. Some people with ADD will just leave a relationship. They won't even be able to know why they're leaving. They just know that it's going wrong again and they don't know why. And they'll just leave. Uh, rationalizing and blaming. Same with quitting a job. You know, it's kind of the same thing. Just, I've had it, I'm done. Controlling. People who don't feel a lot, who feel a lot of chaos often can react by uh, exerting control. And again, this is kind of a smart strategy in a way. If, if you tend to go into chaos or disorganization to have a rigidly scheduled calendar or, or routine. But the problem comes when something upsets that routine and you can't cope, you can't adapt or be flexible. So you, it might work when you're single, but then when you get married, or then when you have a child, or then when you get promoted at work or something, then those rigid ways of controlling don't work so well anymore. Being aggressive. Um, you know, when you, when you lack a internal motivation initiation, you can come up with all kinds of ways subconsciously to get yourself motivated. And being aggressive is something that, you know, summons up energy. 